In everyday life, we all have a sixth sense. Some of us are masters of it, others don't know it exists. We use it to make others trust us or love us or to help us keep our jobs. The clues are in our actions. You'll be shocked to find out what you're giving away. You'll be amazed what you can discover about other people. I call these clues tells, a term that comes from the game of poker. Tells are central to the exercise of power. In government or in the workplace, they enable people to convince others that they have the necessary qualities to lead. Spot the right clues and you can use this secret language to read someone's mind. A tell is an action which reveals what someone is thinking. To win at poker, players need to work out what kinds of cards the others are holding by looking out for their tells. A tell could be the way someone holds their cards, or gazes at their chips, or scratches their nose. But tells aren't just found in poker. We all use them all the time. These telltale signs reveal the secrets that people usually keep to themselves. I read people's tells in all kinds of situations, and you can too, with friends, at home, or at work. And you can use tells to read the mind of anyone, including your boss, a movie star, a prince, or the prime minister. George Bush is anxious more often than his country knows, but how can we tell? Who outmaneuvers Tony Blair on his own doorstep? What has Prince William been covering up ever since he was a toddler? And having hidden the truth the first time round, how did Bill Clinton persuade America to accept his apology? If politicians knew how they were exposing themselves, they'd be horrified. Politics is all about appearances. It's not enough to be powerful, you need to look and sound powerful as well. To wield power effectively, leaders need to find ways to convince others that they're tough, dominant and healthy, as well as friendly, approachable and sincere. They need to acquire the tells of power. Political leaders try to show everyone that they're physically fit. That's because the public unconsciously infers the health of the body politic from the health of the leader. Notice the affected way that President Bush walks. He swings his arms up and across his body. This is the power walk. It exaggerates the male walking style by emphasizing the upswing of the arms and rotating the hands so that they face backwards. This makes him look tough, more like a bodybuilder. Tony Blair also knows the importance of looking the part. Soon after George Bush became president, he went to visit him at Camp David. We find Blair with his hands in his front pockets, trying to look cool something he doesn't do when he's feeling relaxed. He's doing it because Bush is making him feel uncomfortable. Later, on the same visit, we see him doing it again. Bush has changed into his bomber jacket. He's definitely up the macho stakes, and Blair is trying to match him. It's clear that Bush is calling the shots and that Blair feels upstaged. Once again, his hands seek refuge in his front pockets. He definitely isn't happy playing Tonto to Bush's Lone Ranger. The President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton. As well as looking physically strong, politicians also need to look sincere. Bill Clinton has his very own trademark tell for sincerity. 
When he wants people to think that he's being sincere, he briefly narrows his eyes. I don't think Clinton is aware he's doing this. It's more likely that he makes a conscious decision to appear sincere and that his eyes narrow automatically without him knowing it. But it's a different story when it comes to showing his feelings. Here, Bill Clinton is the past master. He doesn't mind being emotional in public. In fact, he seems to relish the opportunity. Clinton's emotional displays are often deliberate. Here, he's at the funeral of a cabinet colleague. He's laughing and joking, unaware that he's being filmed. Suddenly, he spots the television camera. He immediately stops laughing, lowers his head, adopts a mournful expression, and appears to wipe away his tears. Here, Clinton knows exactly what he's doing. But when it comes to deliberate tells, Clinton's pierce de resistance is his lip bite. He does this when he wants us to think that he's been overcome with emotion. The lip bite pretends to be an unconscious means of self-restraint, a way of controlling strong emotions. But its real purpose is to draw attention to his feelings. Like the time he asked the American people for forgiveness for his misdemeanors with Monica Lewinsky. On this occasion, he deploys the lip bite no fewer than 15 times in just over two minutes. I don't think there is a fancy way to say that I have sinned. I have asked all for their forgiveness, that I have done wrong. Because the lip bite is so discreet, people who see it don't necessarily notice it. This doesn't mean that they aren't affected by it. They are, they just don't know it. The only difference between a sinner and a saint is that one's found forgiveness and the other one ain't. Amen. Some tells are under our control, and we can therefore use them to create a false impression. But there are also unconscious tells that we don't know we are producing. <laughs> the newly elected George Bush is on his way to his inauguration. He's alongside the outgoing President Clinton. You can see that Clinton is relaxed and that Bush is nervous. But why? What are the tells that reveal it? Look how George Bush is biting the inside of his mouth. It's one of his trademark tells. It shows that he's feeling nervous. It's what psychologists call emotional leakage. There are two things to notice about Bush's mouth bite. Firstly, it's a restraining, self-comforting gesture. Secondly, it's intended to be hidden. It's Bush's secret way of keeping his anxieties under control. If you were a poker player observing other people's tells, you'd try to memorize what they did at the precise moment that they realized something. This is the terrible moment when President Bush was told about the planes crashing into the Twin Towers. Look at his mouth bite. This moment confirms beyond all doubt that the mouth bite is what George Bush does when he's feeling anxious. If George Bush knew this, he'd be horrified. But what about British politicians? Gordon Brown. Gordon Brown has a trademark tell. It's one of his specialities. Touching his papers seems to give him a sense of security. When he's speaking, he produces an unusual display. Nigel, uh, in thanking you for your invitation, uh, let me, first of all, on behalf of the, the government and the Labour Party, join the congratulations uh, to Brendan Barber.
Most unconscious tells are linked to negative emotions, to feelings like anxiety, embarrassment, and insecurity. One place where you often see these signs is when people are moving from one situation to another. Tony Blair, for example, often plays with his cufflinks as he comes into view. This is a transition tell. It's a displacement activity which transfers his anxieties to a non-essential action. But the king of transition tells is undoubtedly Prince Charles. Charles has a whole armory of them. Here's a typical sequence. He does a tie fiddle, a jacket fiddle, a pocket fiddle, another tie fiddle followed by a jacket fiddle, and just like Tony Blair, a cuffling fiddle. Different people have different transition tells. Prince William is at Highgrove with his father. They are going to meet the press. Notice how William strokes the top of his head. This is one of his transition tells. He does it as he crosses a psychological boundary, the point in his mind when he comes on duty by entering the public arena. It's a sign of uncertainty. When the interview is over, he and Prince Charles walk back to the house. Watch how William touches his head again, almost at the exact same spot where he did it previously. It's like clocking off duty. The uncertainty is over. This is a classic transition tell because the action only occurs on the way in and the way out of the situation, not during the encounter with the press. William's crown clasp isn't new. In fact, he's done it ever since he was a toddler. Here, Tony Blair is being harangued by a member of the public. He's in real trouble. He's doing his best to appear composed, but something gives him away. Look at his chin. It's pulled back. This is the chin tuck. Consciously, Blair knows that she's not going to physically attack him but his brain isn't taking any chances. It's protecting the place where she's most likely to punch him. This fear of being attacked is surprisingly common, even among the highest ranking politicians. It's a new day, change is on the way. Politicians like Bill Clinton are fond of what I call the oxbow mouth. Here the lower lip is pressed up so that the mouth looks like an inverted letter U. Politicians like doing this because they think it makes them look determined. But because the gesture stiffens the chin, it shows that he's unconsciously worried about being punched. The oxbow mouth isn't a sign of determination, it's a vulnerability tell. And that's why it was so prevalent during the Monica Lewinsky affair. Monica Lewinsky says that you used a cigar as a sexual aid with her in the Oval Office area, which you'd be lying. Yes, no, or, or won't answer. I will revert to my former statement. Watching our political leaders, I've often wondered, do people become powerful because they produce the right tells, or do they start producing power tells after they take office? Watch Tony Blair campaigning to become an MP for the first time. It's over 20 years ago. He's very much in the shadow of the then Labour leader, Michael Foote. But look, even back then, his hands are slipped into his jacket pockets. It's not a power tell, it's one of Blair's leakage tells. Exactly the same one he used two decades later, when as Prime Minister, he met President Bush. It's leakage tells, those that reveal discomfort, that politicians bring with them to the job. You don't, for example, see politicians doing the power walk until they've got the top job. They only acquire power tells when they get power. We've seen how individual politicians try to project themselves as physically strong, sincere and dominant. 
So is it any surprise that there's a hidden power struggle when world leaders come face to face? We've discovered how individual politicians use the secret language of power. But what happens when they get together? A handshake looks like a friendly gesture. But in fact, it's one big tell. Depending on how politicians shake hands, they come across as more or less in control. It's a power game with elaborate and subtle rules. If I were a politician trying to control the handshake, Here's what I would try to do. I'm going to go for the upper handshake. First, I'd get onto the left-hand side and try to get my hand on top. Then I'd grab the other person's elbow. When the cameras capture the image, I'd be the one who's in control and who quite literally has the upper hand. Maybe that's why the Prime Minister looks so puzzled when I do it to him. Politicians who know what to do can use the handshake to put each other at a psychological disadvantage. The leaders of two superpowers are about to meet in the Grand Hall of the Kremlin. They're here for delicate discussions on each other's nuclear arsenals. But first, there's the crucial matter of the handshake. Who's going to come out on top? Way in advance, Yeltsin raises his hand so that Clinton has no choice but to place his hand underneath. Yeltsin completes his control over the handshake by grasping Clinton's arm. He has Clinton exactly where he wants him. Being on the left side of the picture exposes more of the politician's arm and subliminally makes them look more powerful. Here the German Chancellor Gerhard Schröder has positioned himself on the left, thereby assuming an advantage over his guests. But he hasn't bargained for President Clinton. Clinton reorients his body towards the photographers. He exposes his right arm and drives Schröder backwards. Clinton is only interested in the cameras. Schröder is completely outmaneuvered and he knows it. There are two world leaders in this picture, but Clinton makes sure that it's a one-man show. The very act of touching is itself an important power tell. The most tactile of all modern leaders is President Bush. Touch for him is a way of connecting with people. It's also a way of asserting himself. Touch operates as a status reminder. Just after the American presidential election, in which he actually polled fewer votes, Bush met his opponent, Al Gore. Watch how Gore is ready for Bush and makes himself look more important. First, Bush gets in his trademark backpat, but Gore is positioned to score the advantage. In the race for the White House, Gore lost out, but on his own home turf, he's determined to win the battle to have the last touch. Such tells, loved by politicians, are also used by those who enjoy the power that comes from fame. Tom Cruise is being welcomed onto the stage at a premiere. He shakes hands with his host and they both grab each other's arm. When the handshake ends, the host is still holding on to Tom. As he lets go, Tom comes back and pats his host. He's reminding the host that he's more important. For aficionados of tells, such displays create something of a spectator sport. After the familiar photo shoot, convention dictates that the host guides the visitor away from the scene. 
usually by placing an arm behind the visitor. Allowing someone to go through the door first is widely seen as a gesture of politeness. In fact, it's a doorstep tell, a classic exercise in power that hands control to the host and puts the visitor in a slightly subordinate position. Somehow, politicians seem to understand this. That's why they dislike going through the door first. Look at Clinton trying to steer Major through the front door of number 10. When neither party is host, these tussles can really heat up. That's exactly what happened when the Palestinian leader, Yasser Arafat, and the then Israeli Prime Minister, Ehud Barak, were guests of President Clinton. Arafat and Barak represented the opposing sides in the age-old conflict between their peoples. Watch what happens when they try to decide who's going through the door first. At the time, the media regarded this incident as a piece of good-humoured horseplay about who was the more polite, but the media hadn't read the tells. They failed to recognize that Barak and Arafat were engaged in a battle of arms control. Deep down, neither wanted the other to look powerful. They both wanted control. This kind of one-upmanship can take many forms. In 1992, Bill Clinton won the presidential election. On inauguration day, he arrives at the White House. The outgoing President Bush and his wife Barbara are there to greet the Clintons. On the surface, the Bushes seem to be the perfect hosts. But if you look more closely, you can see the secret language of competition. Notice how Bush locates himself at the edge of the top step, forcing Clinton to shake hands while he's standing below him. It's Bush's way, quite literally, of keeping Clinton down. Clinton responds by making a fuss of the dog. It's his way of showing where his true admiration lies. Barbara pats Hillary. This is intended to look like a friendly gesture. In reality, Barbara is reminding Hillary that she is still the first lady. History repeated itself eight years later on the inauguration of the next president. This time, the Clintons welcomed George W. Bush and his wife, Laura, to the White House. Bill Clinton positions himself strategically on the top step, extending his arm and forcing George Bush to shake hands while he's standing on the step below. Bush can't resist the opportunity to pat Hillary on the elbow, another example of the power touch. But George Bush gives something away. He's clearly overwhelmed by the occasion because when he thinks nobody's looking, he surreptitiously bites the inside of his mouth, his trademark anxiety tell. There have been other moments that reveal a hidden power game between these two men. Watch them trying to outstrut each other like a pair of muscle-bound bodybuilders. This is not how normal people walk. It's Clinton who manages to get ahead of Bush, but Bush won't be eclipsed. Watch how he gets his own back by sneaking his elbow in front of Clinton's. Such tells reveal the power games hidden behind the smiles. Kelly, you up for one more turn? To me, spotting tells is a way of seeing through what's being said to what's really going on. Once you can understand the secret language of tells, most mysteries appear in a totally new light. That's why I've come to Bournemouth for the Labour Party annual conference to put tells to the test. Welcome to 
Studying the tells here should cast light on one of the biggest power dramas in Britain. The continuing speculation about the leadership struggle between Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. Today, the Chancellor is giving his speech to the conference. Everyone is wondering whether he'll use the opportunity to position himself as the leader in waiting. Conference, can I ask you to welcome Chancellor and his chair, Gordon Brown. The relationship between a prospective leader and the party is like a courtship dance, full of subtle messages. To lead a party, a politician needs to have vision. On the podium, Gordon Brown is like a general, rallying the troops before the battle, reminding them that their cause is just and that they have much to be proud of. Brown's emphatic hand movements are reassuringly confident. This is what you'd expect of a party leader. Best when we're boldest, best when we're united, best when we are Labour. Gordon Brown has sent a very clear message, both to the Labour Party and to Tony Blair. The morning after Gordon Brown's speech, everyone is wondering how Tony Blair will respond. Today, he's giving his annual address to the party. Will the tells show us whether he's a leader on the defensive who might be on his way out? Or will he project the dominance tells of a man who's in control. In many ways, what we're going to witness today is a kind of political version of a poker game. And that's because Brown's raised the ante. He's raised the stakes. And the interesting question on everybody's mind is, is Tony going to be able to match the bid? And it's very much a game of bluff, simply because Brown has put his cards on the table and we're now going to see whether or not Tony has the hand that everybody expects of him. But what's fascinating about all of this is it's not simply a matter of conventional politics. It's also essentially about the matter of tells. Does Tony project himself as the kind of person who still has the command of the party? Or does he leak out little tiny indications of insecurity, suggestions that it's time for somebody else to take his place? Look at that. That is a typical Blair tell. It's one of his trademark gestures. But that's not his only one. He's also using a variety of precision movements in order to emphasize his point. And he's using this very distinctive gesture, which in effect is a way of presenting his knuckles. It's a high dominance gesture. Notice also that he's using various stabbing and cutting movements. These are very much his trademark tells and they're all designed to create an impression of somebody who's in control and who's also a powerful politician. And you know, when the Tories lose an election now anywhere in the country, they say it's not their natural territory. Tells teach you that clues are often to be found in places where we don't normally look. If you want to find out who's winning the poker game between Blair and Brown for the heart of the party, you don't necessarily look at Blair who's speaking, you look at Brown. It's said among political journalists that Blair and Brown are kept separate so that you can't film them together. We took this rare opportunity to do something quite unusual we studied Gordon Brown's tells during Tony Blair's speech. From the moment Blair appears on the podium, Brown starts producing distress signals. For example, looking down at the ground and pressing his tongue against his cheek. Brown's cuffling fiddle is a displacement activity. Here it's not a transition tell, 
but it's still a sign of anxiety. During the 15 minutes or so that Blair was on the podium, Brown plays with his cuffs 29 times, a sure sign that he's feeling anxious. Brown also produces a number of self-comforting and defensive gestures, like smoothing his hair, touching his face, biting his lip, and folding his arms. There are 55 rounds of applause during Blair's speech. If we do a little test and compare Brown with three of the ministers around him, we find that in nine out of every 10 rounds of applause, Brown is either the last or the second last to start clapping. Not only is he late, but his lack of enthusiasm also shows in the slow tempo of his clapping. During Blair's speech, Brown produces a total of 322 discomfort tells. Most of these occur when Blair is riding high, when the audience is clapping or they're enjoying his jokes. When we look at the ministers nearby, we find that on average, they produce less than a fifth of the discomfort tells produced by Gordon Brown. I came here to put tells to the test, and I've discovered two things. Brown has behaved like a leader in waiting, and, for the moment at least, everyone knows that Blair still has his hands firmly on the top job. If a psychologist had a patient who displayed these signals, he'd be forgiven for thinking that he'd hit a raw nerve. It's clear that tells can help you to read the minds of politicians. But what can the secret language show us about the people who pull rank in our daily lives? The next stage of my journey takes me into new waters. I've been invited to spend the day with one of Britain's oldest institutions. I'm on my way to join one of the Royal Navy's fleet of destroyers, HMS Gloucester. The Navy is fascinating because it's a traditional and inherently hierarchical organization. There should be lots of power tells on display. As captain of the Gloucester, Commander Cree wears the badges of office. Like everyone else in the Navy, he's defined by his rank. There's something very interesting happening on board today. HMS Gloucester is taking part in war games. Everyone has been ordered to change into battle dress. Once we've finished, I should know where my weak links are, if there are any, but I'll also know that everybody is capable of doing um, the job to a certain level. And so I do trust them, and, I, and I've got to trust them. I can't control every event on board. Watch how the captain issues his commands. We keep it calm on the port side, please. This is where you see the power tells. When he's giving an order, the captain pointedly looks straight ahead. The captain doesn't orient his body towards the officer. He hardly looks at him, or bothers to find out whether he's taken the order on board. We shut down the sections. You can see from the tells that the captain's in charge. The war games on board HMS Gloucester are designed to test the command structure. It's very important that the captain appears to be calm and collected. Now, normally this is fairly easy. But in moments of crisis, when there are lots of demands and distractions, it can be extremely difficult. It's then, when everyone is looking to the captain for guidance, that he most needs to project an image of confidence and control, when the chips are down. 
This is where I would expect to see the captain using lots of power tools. But he isn't. Here again, he's looking ahead, but it's to monitor his computer screen, not to demonstrate that he's in charge. Do not peel over on the side of the torpedo. Get your fast aid charge, get one else. He's definitely leading his team, but he's not pulling rank and he's not using power tells to assert his position. Right, ops, follow me now. But why? I now see that Commander Cree's rank removes the need for dominance gestures. He knows his team will comply with his orders, even if they think he's wrong. Where there's time, you listen. Where there isn't time, you may have to make a snap decision, and they just have to get on with it. If they know it's wrong, if they're absolutely convinced it's wrong, then I'd expect them to at least come back one more time. But uh, no, when the decision's made, then people just have to do what they're told, basically. It might not seem like it, but what we see here is what we might witness in any office on any day. Somebody's exercising power and trying to get others to follow orders. In the modern workplace, pulling rank isn't fashionable. Especially in a company like Microsoft, which is renowned for its flat structure. Neil Holloway is one of Microsoft's 10 most powerful bosses. Watch what happens when his management team greet each other. They don't adjust their height. But look, when they shake hands with Neil, they give a slight dip of the head. They're acknowledging his seniority. Even though he's one of a new breed of non-hierarchical business leaders. You've got to have empathy and you've got to put yourself in the shoes of the, the, the employee. And if you do that, they'll open up much easier. So when someone doesn't dip their heads to Neil, what happens? This delegate is being quite familiar because he pats Neil on the shoulder. Neil isn't having it. He asserts himself and comes back with a double pat. Now that's a power tell. It's similar to what Tom Cruise did to assert himself. And what Al Gore did to George Bush. Maybe I should briefly explain. Notice Neil's gestures. Watch for the power tells. At first glance, it looks like he's using his hands to shield himself, but he's actually presenting his knuckles. It's a disguised way of being dominant. But we have to say what, we, what our goals are. It's exactly the gesture we saw Tony Blair using when he addressed the Labour Party conference. It's not the only gesture that these two bosses share. Neil uses the two-handed stab to ram home the points he's making. This is also a dominant gesture. We can see this because the wrists are stiff rather than bent. It's another gesture we've seen used by Tony Blair. The success of Neil's leadership style can be measured by looking at the tells of his audience. Most of them are producing attentiveness displays. They're covering their mouth, an action that's inconsistent with talking. It's therefore an unconscious, respectful way of showing Neil that they have no intention of taking over the speaker role. Or the enterprise selling business. At Microsoft's management meeting, no one's giving orders, but it's obvious who's in charge. You can see it in the power tells. The question is, what happens to these tells when things are more relaxed? When you go down for a cup of coffee, guess what? You've got to almost act slightly differently. But again, if, if you, depending on how you talk to that person as well, if you're empathetic and you're talking the same language, you can just as easily be part of the crowd. And they, they love that. And then they also love you being the leader. Here's an informal conversation where all three men are standing with their hands on their hips. This is a dominance posture. Somebody's going to have to give way. Neil makes his move. He points at one of the other people and symbolically pushes him down. This has the desired effect because the other person folds his arms. 
Neil is now able to continue talking unchallenged. Even when they are being informal, the people here are constantly reaffirming their status positions in relation to each other. Most of the time people don't know they're doing this, but they can't help themselves. The tells take over. While I was on HMS Gloucester, I realized that power tells are much less common in the Navy than they are at Microsoft. This is not something I'd expected to find, but it makes perfect sense. Commander Cree doesn't need to enlist respect by producing dominance tells. He already has the respect of his crew by virtue of his position. But I think that in most offices, including Microsoft, we're constantly having to remind each other who's in charge. At the very top of the power pyramid in Britain sits the monarchy. The Queen is the head of state. She doesn't need to produce power tells. In fact, it's fair to say that her trademark tell is the hand clasp. She's used it throughout her reign. This, in fact, is a demure, submissive gesture. It even has an element of self-comfort about it. The Queen's job is a lonely one. She doesn't have anyone to hold her hand, so she holds it herself. Prince Philip, of course, is the consort. He is not the head of state. In contrast with the Queen, he has a habit of standing with his hands behind his back. It's his trademark tell. It's what I call the crane. This is a dominance posture because it shows that he doesn't feel any need to defend himself. In all walks of life, effective leaders are those who produce the right tells for their job, whether they're running a business, a ship, or a country. So tells show how power works in British life. But what do they reveal about Britain's place on the world stage? Who looks up to us and who looks down? Once you know about the secret language of power, you can see the game our leaders are trying to win. Now that you've been let in on the secret of doorstep tells, you can use it to create a league table of prime ministers and presidents and spot which country's leader is top dog. Remember the trick is to be last through the door. On his last visit to London, President Bush didn't behave like a guest. He took control, slipped his hand behind Tony Blair and guided him through his own front door. In this case, it's definitely America won Britain nil. Soon after that defeat, France's proud leader Jacques Chirac called on Tony Blair. Watch the doorstep tell. Chirac scores the victory. Once again, Tony looks like a guest on his own red carpet. This time, it's France 1, Britain 0. So what happens when Bush and Chirac, the two world-beating doyens of the doorstep, meet? Can we detect a global pecking order? Who gives way to whom? This time, Chirac was playing at home, so he had the advantage. Bush was one of the guests. When they took up their positions, there was no way of knowing who would win. Chirac made the first move, but Bush was quick to counter, getting his arm behind Chirac. Bush had taken control. It was a narrow victory. United States won, France nil. When poker players let their guard slip, they can lose money because the other players can read their tells and guess what kind of hand they've got. A politician like Gordon Brown could also be losing out. By letting his tells leak, he makes it easier to read his mind. As a result, so far at least, Tony Blair has come across as the more confident leader. But I think there's one final tell that plays a part in this, their smiles. Blair's looks real, but Brown's doesn't. 
If there were a competition to find the politician with the most synthetic smile, Gordon Brown would probably be the winner. His speciality is the flashbulb smile. One moment his face is in repose, the next a smile has been switched on, and a moment later it's gone and the face is back to normal. Could this even be part of the reason why Tony Blair is Prime Minister and Gordon Brown is not? To be successful, people in power need to understand the secret language of tells. In recent times, the leader who's done this best is Bill Clinton. As we've seen, even when he's in desperate trouble, he manages to present his best side. I have asked all for their forgiveness. He's the politician who wins the prize as the master of the tells. Clinton projects the right messages because he understands the power of tells. Most of the time, he knows exactly what he's doing. By mastering the tells, he makes himself appear both dominant and likeable. But even if you have the most powerful job in the world, political power is temporary. It's overshadowed by the symbolic, almost magical power wielded by the crown. Unlike in the United States, the British head of state is not limited to two terms of four years. <laughs> when the Clintons come to Buckingham Palace, Bill is feeling uncharacteristically anxious because he ends up with one foot below the other. We can often see this awkwardness when other politicians come face to face with the Queen. Notice how the Czech president, Václav Havel, anxiously wipes his hand when he meets the Queen. The Queen often has this effect on world leaders. See how stiff George Bush looks in her presence. No sign of a power walk here. I've looked really closely at this moment, and you can see how awkward Bush is feeling. Watch his hands when the American national anthem begins. He thinks it's a toast, he picks up his glass, he puts it down, and eventually he gets his hand to his chest. He's the most powerful man in the world. He can bring down countries and change the lives of everyone on the planet. But when he's next to the Queen, the American president is a bundle of nerves. By looking for the tells that they can control, we can see how the powerful are trying to influence us. By looking at the tells that they can't control, we can see their true emotions and their shortcomings. No one in power is ever safe from someone who can read their tells. <laughs>